Welcome back. Well, we have another terribly hot day. I don't know why Audie is with me. I should think he'd be somewhere, you know, not sharing body heat. Uh, but he's here nevertheless. Um, so do you want to say hello? I had to haul him off the neighbor's porch today while their patio. Um, he came home with a chipmunk in his mouth this morning. And the smart little thing was playing dead because he loses interest in them when he thinks they're dead. So I yelled at him and told him to let it go. So he did. And the little chipmunk scurried off. I told him he was a naughty cat. And so naturally he had to go over to the neighbor's patio so that I would understand I had hurt his feelings. And obviously I had to go over there and collect him, you know, pick him up and carry him home so that he would understand I didn't mean to hurt his feelings. I just don't want him killing chipmunks. So I hope the poor little chipmunk is all right. It just ran into the hedges and I haven't seen it since. But Audie's feelings were hurt. And so now see, it's my job to sort of suck up to him and make him understand I really don't hate him. I just don't want him killing chipmunks. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Well, we will be back in a minute with a little bit of a Bedford Antiques haul. I know, just when you thought I had cleaned them out. Gee, just when I had thought I had cleaned them out too. In a minute. So let's start with the film that I took in Bedford of the first piece I want to show you. Well, let's take a look at this. This is not at all what I was looking for, but that is um, a non-working, definitely atomic satellite lamp in need of some serious improvement and it's $15 let me grab that ticket for you $15 as is now you gotta know that first of all I'm seeing a project here and second wow these satellite lamps are so hot this is like it's like geez Sputnik and this little shop here, perhaps you'll recall, well, I'm going to take you over. Step, step, step. Remember the Fiesta Ware? And remember this little corner in here is where I found that beautiful rose medallion vase. So, I have a feeling that this is going to be one of my regular stops from now on. Here it is. Um, this is uh, it's a flying saucer lamp. There's, there's no other way to describe this. Uh, this is going to be a project piece because, as you can see, the chrome is very badly rusted. That has to be dealt with. Um, the white enamel is actually quite good, but also there is no bottom on this. And I wonder if perhaps it wasn't designed to, to hang upside down. Not really sure. Regardless, I happen to think that it has a wonderful look for a nice satellite sort of sputnik -y, atomic age night. 1950s lamp like this but it will need a base uh, it will need the rust removed and I don't know it will need to be oiled I don't know if this bulb is working but the key to this lamp is a long neck bulb now fortunately they still make these bulbs this is a general electric bulb and GE has been using 
the same logo on their bulbs since I was a kid. So this bulb could be a year old, it could be 40 years old, no idea. But if I'm going to put this lamp on market, I have to make sure that the new owner is going to be able to get bulbs for it. So I'm going to have to get some modern bulbs. Um, they're still made. I can go with GE or Sylvania, but I won't go with any, um, any off-brands. The reason for that is when you buy a lamp, and you need a special kind of bulb, you need some assurance that that bulb is always going to be available. If we stick with the major brands, people who have been making these bulbs for 50 years, there's a better than average chance they're going to make it for another 50 years. And that's the best you can do. You can never guarantee, especially with lighting, because my goodness, lighting has changed so much in the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, remember halogen bulbs and then they had compact fluorescence LEDs. Today, now, the big thing is the Edison bulbs and those are LEDs too. And, um, it, it's changing. But I can take steps to protect the new owner at least to some extent and of course I'm going to do that. So that will be a project we'll have to turn that flying saucer into a desk lamp. Um, that should be fun. So, let's take a look at some of the other stuff. Um, I think coming up next was, oh yes, the little, the crowded, crowded, tightly packed little booth. Let's take a look at that. Well, I've been prowling around in this little booth here, and as you can see, very crowded. In fact, I actually had to leave my bag out here as I wandered in, but it was worth the trouble it took to squish in because there's this beautiful little Japan teapot with a matching plate. Very nice, $3.00. And this for $4, which is an invalid feeder. Hmm. All right, I imagine what happens is you pour gruel down the throat of the invalid. Um, obviously a relic of days gone by. But I think that would make a great little indoor garden watering can. For $4, that is coming with me. For $3, the little single-serve teapot is coming as well. Well, this was up on the second floor at Bedford. And I just sort of wiggled in there and got those two pieces. This, which is being described as a teapot for one, is the little matching saucer, uh, the teapot, and... It's made in Japan. It has a beautiful look of, of old Nippon China. Now, Nippon just means Japan. It's not a company name, but it's the type of China patterns that were coming out of Japan in the early part of the 20th century. I have cat hair all over me from that tail. Oh. I'm not sure this is actually a teapot or one because that does not look like a teapot to me. I've seen a lot of teapots, including small ones. I think this is probably a syrup or, or um, gravy pitcher. Uh, that spout is wide enough. You could certainly pour thick gravy through it. Not my mother's. My mother's was very lumpy, uh, but ordinarily thick gravy. You know, not my mother's lethal stuff. You could patch dams with my mother's gravy. I would say syrup pitcher. That is what I'm going to call it. But it's a beautiful piece. Um, very nice with the saucer. You could do a lot with that. It's sort of creamer, sugar bowl, syrup, teapot, you name it. Especially because of that cute little lid. And here is our invalid feeder. And I just have the most horrible pictures in my mind of somebody shoving gruel 
into this, it rather looks like a urinal to me. And shoving it down the throat of a sick person, that just, oh my. I'm, believe me, if you are unwell at the beginning of that process, can you imagine what you're going to be like at the end of the process? However, it's beautiful white china marked 22 at the bottom, which means 22 karat gold for the trim. So this is a very nice piece. There was a little label on it that said um, this belonged to Aunt Ella's sister. That was just somebody's way of identifying it, I imagine. But that came off in the washing as I rather expected it would. Nevertheless, this is a nice little piece. Hopefully nobody is going to force feed sick people with it, but I can easily see this as, uh, well, as anything. This is an interesting creamer. This is uh, an interesting little gravy boat. This, this is great. You could probably put just about anything you wanted in this and pour it into something, hopefully a dish and not down somebody's throat. But I thought that was great. Um, okay, let's see. Next up, the rest of these things were from some, no, those were from some fairly crowded booths. But we're going to take a look afterward at the films that I caught. I think I caught some of them in the booth, and some of them I had to wait until I was downstairs checking out in order to film them. So let's just take a look now, and then I'll show you the film later. This is a very nice lusterware piece in the traditional Nortaki design. Um, it's wonderful because of all the blues. Nortaki patterns are very often sunset colors. Um, no idea why. It could be because they came out in the jazz era, and we've talked about the colors that were very popular. In fact, I've been talking about that a lot lately. Sunset colors were really popular jazz era colors. Um, so maybe that was an influence. But these are just beautiful blues. Very nicely executed. We've got our little swan right there. A nice piece. It's obviously it's a platter. You can tell from the little sort of pseudo handles. These are not really handles. They're, uh, you can't stick your finger in here. They are just sort of, I don't know, the impression of a handle, let's say. But it's a very nice platter. The condition's beautiful. The design is really nice. And I think for this piece, the major factor is going to be the eye appeal. Just beautiful blues and then that nice peach rim. Are you coming back? Well, okay, I'll pick this up. You can come up if you would like. All right, um, yeah, okay. That's all right. It's all right. Come on. You can come over. It's okay. But you've got to get right up over here, there, so that your weight is fairly evenly distributed. We've talked about that. Yes, all right, do you want to say hi? I told them what a naughty boy you were this morning. Just so you know, I tattled on you. All right, so as you can see, Audie is back. This is a little pink depression glass plate. It's got a ridge design on the outer edge, and in the center, it's got a waffle design. A very interesting little piece. This going to be part of a tidbit tray. I got four of these and they were somewhere between two and three dollars a piece. We'll find out when we look at the film. All right, you can go. And this is Nortaki China in the azalea pattern. Now, the azalea pattern was a, a very common Nor, uh, Nortaki pattern. It was on china sets. I've handled salt and pepper shakers in this pattern. It's very 
very popular still. Um, but this was just a nice batch of pink and white plates. You see what I'm thinking? I'm thinking pink and white plates and a lovely little pink depression glass top. And we've got the start of a tidbit tray. Now, I say we've got the start because there's more. Here's one of these little teapot figurines. I don't know what they are other than figurines. They have a little hole in the bottom. Now this hole was to uh, conserve materials. Figurines were very often made this way. The porcelain was poured into a mold and sloshed around the exterior of the mold. And then you take it out and of course you know, there's this little hole that was in the mold to, you know, that's how they used, how they filled it. Uh, the hole serves no purpose and the inside is empty. So this is just, in effect, a shell. And this is cute. It's, uh, it looks like it's a teapot a wheelbarrow or garden cart or something with a little watering can. Pink with a few accent colors. Very nice. Now, of course, we've got this, remember, and this, so we have a tidbit tray. Now, these were $2 a piece, and I grabbed one, two, three, four. I grabbed six of them. Here's another pink one. This is, I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to say it's a bakery. Whatever it is, it's not very clear. And it's a little tiny teapot-like bakery. I don't know. I do not collect little figurines like this. I've seen many of them, so I know this is common. And I've also seen larger teapots that have designs like this, like, you know, pretend garden carts or pretend bakeries. It's popular. This one is a little teapot pretend house. It says Red Rose on the back, which is, of course, uh, a brand of tea. And again, if you look at those colors, this is pinks with yellows and greens. It's going to look very nice with that Noritake plate and the little depressionware plate. So, uh, oh, this one, too. Let's take a look at this. This one also says Red Rose on the back of it. And it is... This one is an open refrigerator. Uh, I have no explanation for this at all. Why would anyone want a teapot that looks like an open refrigerator? But it is cute as the Dickens. And that's certainly going to go well. There's pink in this. There's also purple and green. Again, that'll look very nice with these plates. This one, another little red rose again and this is ah the cinema because it says bijou it is a cinema shaped teapot this one however is blue and i have a lot of blue lusterware plates that can be used to make tidbit trays with cute little blue teapots on top oh yeah and here we've got this one and this is blue and yellow mostly. Um, this one does not have a little hole in the bottom. Now these little holes, um, I'm going to have to modify the holes. In most cases they're going to have to be expanded a little bit for a small um, reducing shoulder. That, that reducing shoulder is the fitting that I put in pieces like this so they will screw on the top of the tidbit tray hardware. I have reducing shoulders in two sizes. One like this, and let me, see, let me just take a peek and see if I can find a small one. All right, 
I'm going to use these two. This will probably need a larger reducing shoulder to go into it and then a small one screwed in. This is probably going to be fine with a small one. Let's see. Can you see the... Uh, well, let me get it there so that you can see. See the difference in the size of the holes. As I said, the holes are, are random. Um, I'm sure if you had a half a dozen teapots like this, they'd all have different sized holes. And those will become tidbit toppers. This one, by the way, it has a little lid that comes off. And the space inside is very small. If I were to look at this as a container alone, I would say it's a ring box because I don't think you can put anything much bigger than a ring in it. But the bottom will have to be drilled out completely. So, nevertheless, that will make a cute tidbit topper too. So that was the little collection of tidbit toppers. Um, I am very happy because what this is, this little collection is, um, for me, it's an opportunity to get away from the blues and peaches, which is what virtually all my tidbit trays have been like lately, just because of the coincidence of the china I've had available and throw some pink into the bunch. And I think a lot of people who probably didn't want a blue tidbit tray and took no interest in them might be attracted by the pinks. And it's pinks and florals and pinks and teapots. And there is a whole happy little market for, you know, pinks and teapots out there. So we'll see. And finally, um, get this right side up. Voila! Geisha ware. This is a geisha ware candlestick. It's actually very nicely executed. Um, are we right side up? Yes, we are right side up. And I very, very rarely see pieces like these. So I grabbed it because we do have geisha ware collectors. And when I see something unusual, why not? I'll grab it. it it's it's no hardship for me to grab certain pieces if I know there's a market for it. Even if I look at it and say, oh, well, it's just geisha wear. Oh, well, yeah, I'm not buying for me. I am buying for other people. And other people like this. Uh, and I'm just happy to be able to offer something that is unusual, something that they are not seeing every day. And I know because I'm not seeing it every day. And when I brought this down to the cash register, the woman who runs Bedford Antiques had said, well, you don't see that every day. So she's not seeing it every day either. So this is an unusual little piece. Now let's take a look at the films and see what I've got because I really don't remember exactly what I was able to film of this because I had been into some crowded little booths on the second floor and as a consequence I, I don't quite remember what I was able to film in situ as they say. We talked about that before didn't we? Wasn't it in situ I believe was one of our words of the day and that means in its natural situation, which is how you remember it, in situ, in situation. So, um, for example, the lion is in situ in the jungle, that sort of thing. So, it's good to be able to use our words of the day. All right, let's take a look at the films and see what it is I actually did manage to get for you. All right, let's take a look at this. This is beautiful. We're looking at about nine inches. This is the typical Noritake pattern. It's not a Noritake piece. Beautiful lusterware. I love the colors. This sort of blue into pink and purple with the little green. Very unusual for these Noritake designs. All right. Here's our mark, and it's Chikaramachi. We've already discussed this 
the actual factory name is not important, but this is a beautiful piece here. Let's take a look at what is important. Two dollars. So, takeaway from this is you really can go into an antique shop and get items at thrift store prices. All right, here we have um, a set of four plates. These are, we're looking at about mm, seven and a half inches. Noritake, the azalea pattern, $8 as is. So, of course, whenever they say as is, we go scurrying around to figure out where that flaw is right here. There we go. We have one small chip. As you know, that is not going to deter me. But, take a look at this. I actually simply bought unassembled tidbit trays from this particular booth. We have four little depression glass plates, and they were $9. So, let's take one of these that doesn't have a price tag on it. I'm seeing that as part of a tidbit tray. All right, on the other side of that booth, for $2 a piece, look what I found. Um, these, let me find one that's, here we go. They already have little holes in them, which I might have to enlarge for the hardware, but looks to me like we've got tidbit trays just waiting to be assembled. The little teapots in a variety of colors and patterns were all $2 a piece. Very, very cute. And as I've mentioned before, I am accustomed to paying a good deal more for cute little tidbit tray toppers. And let's face it, these are adorable. So I have one more piece that I want to film. Take a look. $3. This is a Geisha Ware candlestick holder um, and this is an unusual piece I don't see very many candlestick holders to be honest with you um, I don't recall having seen one in the past so this is coming home for the sake of our geisha wear collectors okay well um, we are <clears throat> hitting the very very end of our time so we're not going to do word origins. Well, that's not fair. All right, here's here's a quickie. Not word origins. Uh, we're going to do um, difficult words, words that give people trouble. Um, further and farther. Farther refers to real distance. Further refers to metaphorical distance. My neighbor lives two houses farther down the road because it's real distance. Key, we're not going to talk about marriage until we get further along in our relationship because it's metaphorical distance. That's one that gives a lot of people trouble. So, there, at least we're going to have a word pair for the day. All right, have a great day, everyone. I will not see you tomorrow because it's Tuesday and Tuesday is the day off. I will see you on Wednesday. See you then.